Well, it's um, very nice to be here, and I must emphasize that. Oops, sorry. Uh oh. Okay, that um, when I was asked to talk here, um, thinking about what to do, I thought it would be interesting to talk about this, which takes me well outside my area of comfort and of expertise. <laughs> so I am doing an adventure here, which um, I am helped by other people, particularly my colleague John Philippe Huzan. I got a great deal of help from Peter Atkins, and I've been collaborating with uh, David Sloan. Um, and so I will tell you where they have taken part in this. And so, now this is a bit strange, it doesn't want to go down. Hmm. Some, someone in X, oh, there we go. Okay, now the issue of fine tuning is that life is only possible for some values of the fundamental constants of physics. And Brandon Carter, perhaps, is the person who first brought this really to um, a, a physical standpoint. Bernard Carr and Martin Rees wrote a very important paper, which Bernard talked about. John Barrow and Frank Tipler wrote the famous book, The Cosmological Anthropic Principle, which put a huge amount of stuff about this, the physics, the philosophy, the history. Martin Rees has written these two books, Our Cosmic Habitat and Just Six Numbers, which put this very nicely. Stephen Weinberg, as was mentioned, um, has talked about the cosmological constant in particular, that if lambda was too large, no structures would form, no astronomical structures, and hence there would be no life. And Bernard talked about that. And Bernard has edited this book called Universe or Multiverse, where it is proposed by many people that the multiverse is an explanation of the kind of fine-tuning that we see, and of course Bernard mentioned that in his talk. And so there's a large astrophysical and physics literature on fine-tuning and its relation to life, and Bernard summarized that very nicely. Now, what is a fundamental constant? And a fundamental constant of physics are parameters in theory that cannot be reduced to other parameters. And there's already a lot of, as, as Bernard already made quite clear, it isn't quite clear what that means. It depends what your theory is. It's very dependent on your theoretical framework. In some theoretical frameworks, you can reduce some constants to other ones. In other theoretical frameworks, you can't. And so the very concept of a fundamental constant is quite a difficult one, and there are many different papers, theories, and so on about this. And Bernard talked about quite a few of them. What is, I think something which one should stick to very strongly is a fundamental constant should be dimensionless in order to be physically meaningful. Um, the point about that is if you can change the value of the fundamental constant simply by changing <laughs> your the dimensions, then it's, it's not a constant. It's something which depends. It's not a physical entity. Um, so the speed of light C is not a fundamental constant, despite what you might think from a lot of literature, because you can give it any value you like, and in particular you can give it the value 1, which what is what us relativists tend to do. And the same applies to h-bar, and the same applies to g. And so just as an example, there's a, quite a substantial literature on varying speed of light theories in gravity and cosmology. None of them make any sense because in any varying speed of light theory based uh, speed of light theory, you can always set the speed of light to be equal to one by changing your units to light years. And then the speed of light is one and there is no variation. So just as just a side note, if you ever read a paper about varying speed of light theories, um, you need to be very skeptical about it. Now, there's no agreement on the number of constants nor what they are. There's a very, very nice survey article by Jean-Philippe Huzan called Varying Constants, Gravitation, Cosmology. It's a living review of relativity's article. It's on the archive. And in particular, it talks about the fact that there has been a suggestion by <coughs> some people that the constants vary. And he gives a very, very comprehensive survey of what constants are from his particular viewpoint and what the evidence is that some of them might vary. And so I recommend that article highly for those who want to look at it. 
Now, Tegmark has written a lot about this, and he talks, for instance, about the effect of changing the dimensionalities of space and time, the effect of changing the cosmic microwave <coughs> background fluctuations amplitude, which is a quantity Q, which Bernard talked about, the effect of changing neutrino masses, the effect of changing the dark matter density, the dark energy density, and the CMB fluctuation amplitude, the effect of changing the masses of elementary particles, and he has a summary of his effects in a famous paper in the Annals of Physics, um, and so Tegmark is one of the people who has been writing a lot about this and there's a couple of famous diagrams, you've already seen them. This is the one about the dimensions, number of spatial dimensions, number of time dimensions. And you don't want elliptic equations if you're going to have interesting stuff. You don't want it to be too simple. You don't want it to be unstable. You don't want to have tachyons only. You don't want it to be unpredictable because it's ultra hyperbolic. And this ends you up with one time dimension and three spatial dimensions. Um, oops, I'm missing. And just as an example of the literature, here's a paper by Barr and Kahn, anthropic tuning of the weak scale uh, and of the, the b in terms of the mass of the up and the down um, quarks in terms of the two Higgs doublet models. And I can't tell you anything about this. I'm just saying this is the kind of literatures out there in which you've got the mass of the up quark horizontally, the mass of the down quark vertically, and there's a tiny, tiny part of parameter space which is potentially viable in terms of getting um, uh, molecules to, uh, uh, atoms and molecules to occur. Now, the one I'm going to focus on is the fine structure constant. It's a fundamental physical constant characterizing the strength of the electromagnetic interaction between elementary charged particles. It's related to the electromagnetic elementary charge, the electromagnetic coupling constant E, which characterizes the strength of coupling of an elementary charged particle with electromagnetic field by the formula alpha is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught E squared over H bar C. Now that's dimensionless and therefore is the same in all frames. No matter, it doesn't matter what units you use, that will be the same. So E is the elementary charge, H bars, H over 2 pi, the reduced Planck constant, C is the speed of light and vacuum, epsilon naught is the electric constant of permittivity in free space. It has the same numerical value, all systems of units, and the currently accepted value is 7.297 times 10 to the minus 3, or alpha to the minus 1 is 1 over 137. Many people know it rather in that way. And this is the important one, because this is the one which in a particularly obvious way influences chemistry. Now, um, there's a very nice paper there, Effects of the Variation of Fundamental Constants of Population Three Stellar Evolution, uh, by Uzan and others, in which he talks of they talk about a variation of the fundamental constants is expected to affect the thermonuclear rates, uh, ra ra rates important for stellar nuclear synthesis. In particular, because of the very small resonant energies of BE8 and C12, the triple alpha process is extremely sensitive to any such variations. We derive limits on the variation of the magnitude of the nuclear interactions and model-dependent limits on the variation of the fine structure constant based on the calculated requirement that some C12 and O16 be present at the end of the helium bursting phase. And that allows to permit limits on the change of the nuclear interaction and limits of order 10 to the minus 5 on the fine structure constant relative to a scale of 10 to the minus of, of, of Z15 to, to 20. So what you can do, you can do a detailed analysis of nuclear synthesis and get limits on the fine structure constants in order that nuclear synthesis will work out. And that actually involves that Hoyle um, resonance which Burnett was talking about. Uh, this is another paper from, um, a picture from Stegmark, which Bernard already showed you. If you vary the fine structure constant across the bottom and the strong truckling uh, constant vertically, there are no atoms in the blue domain. There's the diproton disaster, which Bernard mentioned over there. Carbon is unstable there. You have to be in that white <coughs> triangle there at the left in order that complex matter can exist. And we are at the little black point, which is right next <coughs> to the diproton disaster there. And so in order that atoms exist, the fine structure constant is highly restricted. Now, both of these last two ones are what I would call physical constraints on the fine structure constant in order that life can exist. But we want to talk about fine-tuning in biology. Biology is not just physics. We want to deal with the fact that cells exist, organic molecules exist, that is carbohydrates, lipids, protein, and nucleic acids. We want to talk about the functioning of living systems, 
And what is possible is determined by possibility spaces, and we had a very nice talk about this by Howard in the previous talk. Now, he mentioned the evolutionary landscape, and Waddington was one of the people who talked about the evolutionary landscape, and this is as you vary um, the, 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 the nature of the genome, and then that results in the, 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 the phenotype varying, you get um, the landscape, which is the, the, probability, the, the, the probability of survival, and you're at a particular point, and then you, you will variations will make you to tend to go down, and it takes it's, it's difficult to go uphill in the evolutionary landscape. Um, but uh, Waddington used this idea of the evolutionary landscape, but the problem with that, Waddington's evolutionary landscape is not, it depends on the context, because this evolutionary landscape depends, for instance, on the fact that the atmosphere is made of oxygen. Now, at the early part of the life, the atmosphere was not made of oxygen, and you would have had a completely different um, possibility landscape. To Waddington's possibility landscape is one which assumes a certain amount already about the environment, and it applies only with certain restrictions on the nature of the environment. But there are real abstract possibility spaces which are timeless and eternal. They are abstract platonic spaces which limit the possible structures and motion of physical systems and also of biological systems. Now, we don't tend to think about these, but I think the deep structure of cosmology is based in possibility spaces. And just as examples of this are the phase spaces of physics, the um, Hilbert spaces of quantum physics. The phase space determines what is possible and not possible for a specific physical system. Hilbert space has determined what is and is not possible for a particular <coughs> quantum system. So the, the idea here is possibility spaces exist as unchanging abstract platonic spaces, capital omega P, P for possibility, limiting all possible structures and motions of physical systems. As an example, if you want to play football, you can kick the football in all sorts of different ways, but you cannot violate energy conservation and you cannot violate momentum conservation. That's written into the phase space which underlies the possible motion of footballs. And that is a timeless and un eternal restriction on what is possible in, in physical motion in the real world. And so these restrictions are the same at all times and all places because momentum conservation and energy conservation doesn't vary across the universe. It doesn't vary with time or place. Our knowledge of these possibility spaces is a representation of that space that is changing with time. And so it's very important to understand that a possibility space omega p, such as the possibility space for physical motions, is understood by us by a projection into a representation E. And the projection changes with time. In other words, before Galileo and Newton, people didn't know about energy conservation and momentum conservation. And afterwards, they did. And so that projection there is something which changes in time. The possibility space never changes, but what we know about it changes with time. This does not mean that physics itself or the possibility allows it changing. It is just our knowledge of it that's changing with time. The ontology, what's possible it exists as a matter of fact, is entailed by the nature of omega p. Omega epistemology, what we know about it, is determined by the projection. And the representation space will be represented in some via some coordinate system set of units which can be changed without changing the nature of the entities being represented. And so I regard this idea of possibility spaces. When the universe was created or born, whatever you want to say, it brought with it a set of possibilities, a set of physical possibilities. We like to describe these in terms of physical laws, but for philosophical reasons, in many ways, it's better to describe them in terms of the face spaces than the physical laws. And just as an example of that, I've written a nice book on um, face spaces and cosmology with John Rainwright, which sets out the possibilities of existence of cosmological models spatial homogeneous cosmological models. And that's an example of a phase space, a possibility space for cosmologies. Now, are there biological possibility spaces? There are the ones like Waddington, but those aren't the deep ones. The deep ones are the ones which Art Lewis was talking about in his talk and the papers he was <coughs> talking about. And I want to point out to you what I regard as one of the most interesting books about biology I've come across for a very long time. The Arrival of the Fittest by Andreas Wagner, talking about platonic 
possibility spaces for microbiology. And the claim there is that what is possible in microbiology, what Art Louis was talking about in his previous talk, these are possibilities which are timeless, eternal, unchanging possibilities. There are only certain metabolic things that are possible because of the way that physics underlies chemistry. There are only certain possible proteins that are possible because of the way that physics underlies chemistry. And this book, Andreas Wagner, The Origins of Evolutionary Innovations, I regard this as one of the great books in biology in the recent times. It solves that problem which some of you were talking about at the end of the last session. How is there enough time for evolution to take place given the fact that there's only a certain number of mutations that have taken place since the start of the universe? So I strongly recommend this book for anybody who's interested in this. He talks about the relation between genotypes and phenotypes, and in particular he talks about gene transcription regulatory circuits, metabolic networks, and protein genotype networks. And each of these is characterized by a possibility space. There's a possibility space for gene transcription regulatory circuits, and you can only construct such a regulatory circuit if it lies within that possibility space. There's certain ways of me metabolic networks. You can only get metabolism to work if you protect a me metabolic circuit which lies in that possibility space. And there's certain possible uh, relations between the, 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 the genes and proteins. And that, again, you can only get the, f the relation between proteins, and the genes and proteins to work if you pick one which lies within the possibility space of protein genotype networks. Now, all of this biology is controlled by biological molecule shape, and Ard was already showing us some of that. You get, you get linear sequences which lead to three-dimensional folding, the lock and key mechanism, and promoters, and the resultant biological effects. And it is this shapes. In effect, molecular biology is the biology of shapes. Shapes at the microbiological level determines biological function at that level, and that then determines what happens at the back macro level. And the question which I want to raise here, the question which hasn't been raised so far in the literature on the anthropic principle, is how, does, how do these spaces relate to the fundamental constants? That's the question which I think is the question which is a very, very interesting question which needs to ex be explored and has not been explored. And so just to kind of illustrate this at the top there is the way that you get a substrate entering an active site for an enzyme. The enzyme and the substrate complex form a complex together. The enzyme, um, the enzyme changes the shape slightly as the substrate binds and then a new product leave afterwards and the whole thing is based on the binding it's based on the binding which is based on the shapes of the molecules fitting together and the actual shapes of the molecules are very very complex and one of the wonderful achievements of the past 50 years or so is the way that it's now absolutely routine to get the shapes of these kind of molecules all of these molecules i remember when max perutz got the Nobel Prize for hemoglobin. It took him about seven years to get the shape of hemoglobin. Nowadays, people do this routinely. Um, research students do this easily in their PhD. But the functioning depends on the three-dimensional folding. That three-dimensional folding depends on the underlying physics. How does it depend? Okay, and here is DNA. There are very slight constraints in terms of DNA, in terms of the bond lengths and angles. When you go around and you want to do that binding, the, the, um, the angle that you turned as you go up a specific length must be right in order that it will fit together. And if you get it wrong, the thing won't get together, fit together. And in fact, when Crick and Watson were trying to work out the structure, the key thing that they had to do was to understand how the bond lengths and angles would fit together in order to allow the DNA structure to come into being. Now, there's a very, very nice book about DNA structure by Caladine and colleagues called Understanding DNA, the Molecule and How It Works. And they talk about how the spiral pattern works, and it depends as you go up, you have to tilt the planes in order that the whole thing fits together. There's a wonderful complex structure there, and Ard Louis has also written about this. But the key point I want to make is just to, in order to make progress on this, I found one particular statement in this book 
the distance between the Dacian sugars or phosphates in the DNA is 6 angstroms. It must be between 5.5 and 6.5 angstroms for it to work. Now that is fine tuning there. The underlying physics has to be such that in the DNA molecule, this distance here between the Dacian sugars and phosphates, which is dependent on the underlying physics, must lie between 5.5 and 6.5 angstroms or DNA won't function. So that's what I'm going to concentrate on. Now, the problem is we can't do DNA from the underlying physics. We can't actually even do water. <laughs> if, you, if you talk to people who've worked in molecular quantum physics, they will tell you that water is very difficult. And I've tried to talk to some people to get... So the question I would like to ask, it's like given that we can't do DNA, I would like to know, how does that incredibly important angle in water depend on the fine structure constant? Because a lot of the biology of water which determines the dipole depends on that angle, and the answer is it's very difficult to determine. <laughs> so this is a key molecule for life, particularly because it's dipole. Philip Ball wrote about that in Life's Matrix, A Biography of Water, and Ard Louie and Simon Conway Morris have written about it. And so I would have liked to have got <laughs> presented to you something about how the properties of water depend on the fine structure constant, and I couldn't find anybody who could do that for me, because I obviously can't do it, because I haven't got the technical... <laughs> Capacity. We'll have to settle for the length of the bond in the hydrogen molecule. <laughs> okay, that's the most complex I'm going to be able to work out for you um, and hope that DNA will work out similarly. In other words, the idea is going to be if we can work out how bonds length in a hydrogen molecule vary with alpha, as a simple extrapolation, we can think maybe they would vary in the same way in the DNA molecule and we use the result of the previous slide to kind of see how fine structure constant will affect biological viability. So anyhow... We, we can argue about this, but it's a reasonable kind of way to proceed trying to get something out of this. So what we need is a dimensionless formulation of the Schrodinger equation. And this is where my colleague Jean-Philippe Zahn helped me very much. Start with the standard Schrodinger equation, I h bar d by dt of psi is h psi, where h is the Hamiltonian. Now, among the constants of the problem, we chose the electric mass, h bar and c. Now, none of those by themselves are good fundamental constants because none of those are dimensionless. But we use them to construct our standards and units, and we do that by introducing units of time length and energy given by the atomic length is h bar over MEC, the atomic time is h bar over MEC squared, and the atomic energy is MEC squared. So those are now our atomic ones. These are still um, dimensional. For instance, the ionization energy with hydrogen in standard units, it's given by a somewhat complicated expression in terms of these units, it's minus a half alpha squared. And so when you use these atomic units, things work out rather simple. Okay, so, so now what we do, the Schrödinger equation is, can be written in dimensionless form in the following way. We write it as, we, we change the time to ordinary time divided by the atomic time and we change the radius to ordinary radius divided by the atomic length. So we have a dimensionless time and a dimensionless size, okay? And in that case, what we get is I dt psi of this dimensionless time and dimensionless radius is minus a half me over m times Laplacian plus v over mec squared times psi. And you write the Laplacian in terms of this dimensionless quantity there. And so at the lowest level, the hydrogen atom takes the form of the, there's p squared over 2me minus e squared over 4 pi epsilon naught r. And so the dimensionless Schrodinger equation takes the form written out there. And now we've got alpha upon rho. And all the, everything now is dimensionless because you've got a ratio of masses, me over m. And that is the dimensionless form of the Schrodinger equation. That's the form we must use in order to find out how the... the dimensionless constants of physics, the fundamental constant of physics affects chemistry. Now, you might start worrying at this point, at the lowest level, rescaling alpha to A alpha and rho to alpha R leaves the second term invariant. So maybe what happens is if you change the fine structure constant, all of chemistry holds unchanged, it's just that molecules are bigger or smaller than you first thought of. But that doesn't work out because the, the, the Laplacian scales as rho to the minus two. So in fact, when you rescale Rho, when you, when, if you change alpha, you can't rescale rho to leave that equation invariant because those two terms scale in different ways. And the hypothesis then is changing alpha, chemistry will not work the same with large molecules. It will change the conformation and so the function of the molecules and so there will be limits on the functioning when you change the fine structure constant. Now, Peter Atkins then came to my help. 
And he is, as you will know, an extremely um, well-known and very, very good quantum physicist, quantum chemist. And the second book I'm going to recommend you, if any of you are interested in looking at this, is this book, Molecular Quantum Mechanics by Atkins and Friedman. It's a wonderful book. It's, it's a very, very pedagogical book, and it goes into the details of how you get quantum chemistry out of physics in a very, very nice way. Well... He uses a slight, he uses the fine structure constants, but he uses in his calculations a quantity beta, which is in written out there in a quantity gamma, and he finds it convenient to work in terms of these three constants. I'm interested in the variation with alpha, and so I'm happy to go along with that for the present purposes. And um, so he, he gives a whole lot of relations between them, and then, so we've got three constants, alpha, beta, and gamma, which are defined there, Beta is h bar 2 MEC and gamma is C h bar and alpha is the fine structure constant I've already talked about. The Bohr radius is then 2 beta upon alpha. Now, if you look at this book and you'll find all of the stuff there, we want to work out the hydrogen atom. The energies are written out there um, in terms of the top, the energy of the nth orbit is written out like that and in terms of the these dimensions, quants constants, it's minus gamma alpha squared over 4 beta, 1 over n squared. The orbital of lowest energy is written out down below there, and the most probable distance of the electron from the nucleus is the Bohr radius, <coughs> which is 2 beta over alpha. And so this gives you how the hydrogen atom scales with, um, with the fine structure constant if we leave the other ones constant. So this is the kind of thing that we can do. But we want a molecule, not an atom. <laughs> so the simplest molecule we can do is the hydrogen molecule iron. As I say, Peter Atkins provided me with this little calculation, which I couldn't possibly have done on my own. And you use what's called the linear combination of atomic orbitals approximation, or LCA approximation. You get a difference of energies, which is written down there. You've got your jth and your kth states. And you, j primed is defined in that complicated way there. K primed is defined in that complicated way. The, the radius um, is, is defined um, in terms of S is, 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 is the radius defined by A naught, which is alpha R over 2 beta. And you, you do that calculation, and then you can calculate what is the most likely um, dis the, the energies of the atoms. And then David Sloan helped me plot these out. This is a graph of the system energy as a function of radius for different values of the fine structure constant. Binding will correspond to a minimum, and various alphas are shown. The blue one is the physical value of alpha. Green and yellow are plus or minus six degrees change in the binding radius. So if you remember, we wanted to have a six degree ch 6% change because that's what was critical for DNA and so we're doing that for the hydrogen atom. Now, we, we can't quite see very easily what's happening so you can plot it in three dimensions here with a variation of energy with radius on the x-axis marked from 0 to 4. 4 change in the fine structure constant on the y-axis uh, and the vertical is the radius of the energy and it's still difficult to see what's happening. So we take the derivative and these are the curves of the derivative as a function of radius and now you can see exactly where the minimums are. The graph of the body R is a function of radius. Various values of alpha are shown. The blue one is the physical value. Green is alpha reduced by 5.6.z and red is alpha increased by 6.4.z. Both give a plus or minus 6% change in the binding radius. And so therefore my preliminary result is that the variation of the fine structure constant which potentially will leave the um, conformational structure of hydrogen atom going is that amount, it's, 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 um, it's, it's, it's 5.6% to 6.4% change. And so we then extrapolate and said that's going to work for DNA as well. That's our first approximation. Um, and this may or may not be true, but the point is what I'm trying to show is the line of argumentation that you can follow. And many people here, someone here may be able to do a heck of a lot better than that, but this is the first that I've been able to come up with. And so then there's a very interesting question. What are the effects of varying alpha on those possibility spaces? What I would really like is the effect of the varying of alpha on the possibility spaces described by Andreas Wagner in this book. That's what I really want to know because he's got these, the, the, 
And which gives the Titus, Titus limits? The limits from biochemistry, the limits from physics, or the limits from astrophysics? Which is the Titus? Do the physics ones include the biology ones, or do the biology ones, which, which is the tighter limit? And it may be that physics gives the tighter limit. If it does, then physics in some sense previews the existence of life. And I illustrate that with this diagram there. On the left is the standard model of particle physics, and that is for allowing all sorts of values of the fundamental constants, but the fundamental constants which actually occur lie in that little circle there. Uh, in, sorry, the, the, those ones which allow, which allow um, nuclear synthesis to work and which allow atoms to exist. So those are the physical constraints on the existence of atoms, such as carbon, are the ones in the yellow circle, okay? Um, it looks from what the calculation I've just done, if that makes any sense, that that lies, the variation from those physical constraints lies well within the variation which life puts on it in terms of restricting the folding of the DNA molecule. Now, I, I, I'm actually, I'm, th that is far too strong a statement because the DNA molecule and the way that the, the proteins work are incredibly complex. And the thing, for instance, the DNA, it's, it's got to keep fitting. The, the, the protein folding has got to work. I wouldn't be surprised if this was completely wrong and if the limits, if you could really do the relation between the fine structure constants and protein folding, which is what I'm really like, I wouldn't be surprised if there was a hugely tighter limit coming out of it. So... It may be that the physics constraint might be tighter than those from life, but I wouldn't be surprised if one could really do the proper calculation that it would come the other way around. Now, does spin effects? That was the, the basic structure of the, of, the, of, the, of the atom, but the question is, does spin matter? Do we have to take fine structure interactions into account in biology? Now, relatively, effects are typically important for heavier elements. <coughs> and so in principle, spin will affect biochemistry with heavy elements. And I just quote from a paper by a book. There's a book, Electron Spin Interactions in Chemistry and Biology, Fundamentals, Methods, Reaction Mechanisms, Magnetic Phenomena, Structure Investigation. It's a book by Lichtenstein and Earl. And it says the present status of the theory of electron spin effects in fundamental processes such as spin exchange and dipole dipole interactions Electron transfer, triplet-triplet energy transfer, and annihilation into systems crossing is re reviewed. These effects form a basis for the understanding of molecular mechanisms essential to chemical and biochemical <coughs> reactions, biological reactions, including photosynthesis and magnetic field influence. And of course, there's quite a bit of work going on about magnetic field influences on burn bird brains and so on. But the photosynthesis is the important one. If the fine structure is important for photosynthesis, it's really important for life. So maybe the fine structure matters for life. It turns out there's a group on spin chemistry in Oxford, in the chemical department. Broadly defined, spin chemistry deals with the effect of electron and nuclear spins in particular and magnetic interactions in general on the rates and yields of chemical reactions. It's manifested as spin polarization in spectra and the magnetic field dependence of chemical processes. Application includes studies of mechanism connected to free radical and bioradical reaction and solution, the energetics of photosynthetic electron transfer again, various magnetic kinetic effects, including possible biological effects of extremely low frequency and radio frequency electromagnetic fields. The question of whether your cell phone is causing damage to your brain is in there. Um, the mechanisms by which animals can sense the Earth's magnetic field for orientation and navigation and the possibility of manipulating radical lifetimes so as to control the outcome of their reactions. And the most interesting one I find is this. Electron spin changes during general anesthesia in dr Drosophila. And this is an article 160 years after its discovery. The molecular mechanism of general anesthesia remains a notable mystery. A very wide range of agents ranging from the elephant element xenon to steroids can act as general anesthetics on all animals from protozoa to man, suggesting that a basic cellular mechanism is involved. In this paper, we show that volatile general anesthetics cause large changes in electron spin in the Drosophila <laughs> fruit slides, and that the spin responses are different in anesthesia-resistant mutants. We propose that anesthetics perturb electron currents in cells and describe ele electronic structure calculations on anesthetic protein interactions that are consistent with this mechanism and account for hitherto unexplained features of general anesthetic pharmacology. Now, that's really interesting, the suggestion that electron spin is responsible for anesthetics. So that means 
means that the brain might be affected in really significant ways. So how do we deal with this? Well, the fine and hyperfine structure can be determined using perturbation theory. You set H as H0 plus W. Fine structure contains three contributions, the spin-orbit interactions described by an L dot S term, where G0 is the electro electron gyromagnetic factor. It can be written in dimensionless form like that, and so that's the dimensionless form of that interaction. This comes again from my colleague, Jean-Philippe Uzan. There's a correction arising from V over C squared relativistic terms. It has that form. And the third and last correction is known as the Darwin term, arises from the fact that in the Dirac equation, the interaction between the electron and the Coulomb field is local. But the non-relativistic approximation leads to a non-local equation for electron spin that's centered at the field in a zone of order of the Compton radius. And it results in an extra term like that. And when you put this all together, including fine and hyperfine structure, the hydrogen atom can be written in the same form as before. And now what you've got there, the first term, the alpha over R, is the one we were talking about before. The second term between brackets on that line is the fine structure, and the third and fourth lines are the hyperfine. Now, and it, this depends on four dimensions, constants alpha, M, E over M, P, G, E, and G, P. Now, I don't believe that the hyperfine structure should be relevant, but I've just given you some papers suggesting that the fine structure should be relevant. So the challenge is to take <laughs> this <laughs> equation here, explore the effects of all the constants in the first and second terms of this Hamiltonian <coughs> on biological function, the structure of DNA, protein folding, and Wagner's possibility spaces, and see if they get tighter limits than the physics constraints. That is the limits for atoms, nuclei, stars, and planets to exist. So there's the kind of limits which Bernard was talking about, which I'm called physics constraints, even what Bernard called chemistry. This was the, co the possibility that chemistry would exist, but not properties of the details of chemistry. And what, what I'm saying is there's a really interesting stuff to be done <coughs> thinking about the effect of these constants <coughs> on those quantities, structure DNA, protein folding, and these possibility spaces. And final couple of comments. Bernard talked about the multiverse. Supposing you have m fundamental physics there and there's a multiverse situation, so one set of fundamental physics leads to all sorts of different outcomes in the standard model of particle physics. So your fundamental physics, string theory, M theory, whatever it is, results in a variety of realizations, the string theory landscape in, 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 in the standard model with different... Um, different constants of physics. One of those may then lead forward to the set of organic molecules which allow life to exist. One of them may allow lead to organic molecules which don't allow life to exist, and one of, one of them may not lead to any organic molecules at all. And so this, in a sense, is the philosophical justification for the multiverse view. So you get, you get a, a viewpoint. So we're going to get fine fine-tuning over here for life in terms of molecules existing, and not just that, but molecules which <coughs> allow life to exist. That's got to come from the, f the standard model of particle physics with the right set of structure fine st of constants of physics, and that will come from one of the realizations. And so this is, so you say there will be many realizations, and one of them will allow life to exist, so the multiverse will allow life to come into existence. The alternative is the dreams of a final theory. Weinberg's book, there's going to be this final theory in which the fundamental theory would lead to one and only one set of constants in the standard model of particle physics. That set of constants has to end up within the set that will allow life to exist because life does exist. And what I want to say about this, if this was the case, if the dreams of the final theory situation was to be correct, the situation would be that in some sense the existence of life was written in to that fundamental theory over there, whatever your symmetry groups, your variation principle, SU5, SU10, O8, whatever it is, in some sense that would have to have the existence of life written into it because it leads uniquely to a set of constants there in the standard model of particle physics, which lead to a set of organic molecules existing which also are compatible with life. And in some sense, that says, as Fred Hoyle used the phrase, <coughs> the thing is a put-up job. In some sense, there's a premeditation or something. 
it's, 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 it's just, it's difficult to express in a certain sense. I'm sure if there are philosophers here, they can express it better than me. But why should it be, if there's one and only one theory of fundamental physics, that it should be such that this chain through to the existence of light's work, that is a very, very mysterious kind of thing to propose. So in summary, the anthropic literature considers in detail the effect of changes in the fundamental constants of physics on physical constraints in order that life can exist, as Bernard talked about it. These constants, e.g. alpha, affect chemistry and hence affect biological function, giving true anthropic constraints. And Bernard talked at the end about there wasn't a lot about life in most of the literature. I've said you can bring life, real life, into the discussion. That's what this is about. And exploring this relation is wide open and very interesting. And I'm very thankful to Jean-Philippe Uzan, Peter Atkins, Ard Louis, and David Sloan for very helpful discussions on this topic.